Roger Green, host of the Surfing the Mash Tsunami podcast. This week, we're offering five conversations from episode 21. I'll review the updated clinical practice guidelines from EASL, EASD, and EASO with Louise Campbell and co-authors Alita Betta, Ujianese, and Frank Taka. Plus, from the vault, a discussion from 2023 about clinical care pathways. This conversation focuses largely on the benefits and challenges that came from what Elizabetha describes as the big advantage coming from this Free Society's collaboration. She comments that the Alliance conveyed a common way to manage patients with mazel, many of whom live with diabetes and obesity. The guidelines also used the nomenclature, which highlighted the metabolic root of the disease. Frank notes that each society had its own approval process, which led to increased rigor from having to meet three standards for each recommendation. He concurs that the collaboration and approach strengthened the guidelines by putting the liver in the broader context of overall metabolic disease. After I note how much more complete this is than the previously released clinical care pathway documents, Louise asks whether the guidelines will increase the profile of the liver disease in other specialties. Elizabeth refers to Ken Kusi's view that, and I quote, it takes time, but she points out two reasons for this integration to be smoother and quicker. Number one, as she puts it, you can't hide cirrhosis. And number two, diabetes and other components of the general metabolic syndrome are pivotal risk factors, not only for mazel, but really for cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma. Frank tells us he'd been concerned at first that the name change would, as he puts it, lose the other societies, but in fact, the reverse was true. Putting metabolic dysfunction at the center of disease definition for the liver links overall cardiometabolic risk to liver disease. Further, the guideline has a chapter on prevention and case-finding strategies relevant to primary care and diabetology or endocrinology practices, even more so in some ways than hepatology. Earlier in the episode, Louise had commended the guideline for including resmeterone even before its approval in Europe. Frank thanks her and notes that the decision to add resmeterone came after U.S. approval and was included within the month before the guidelines were released, similar to discussion of how some glucose-lowering drugs could help treat cardiometabolic comorbidities. As Louise and I each comment at least twice during this episode, these guidelines are exceptionally important in terms of their scope and forward-thinking recommendations. Hopefully, this will energize you to review the actual guidelines, for which there's a link in the article write-up on the Surfing the National Tsunami website. Each conversation is uplifting in its own way, so just sit back, listen, learn, absorb, enjoy. And when you're done, join the conversation in our LinkedIn discussion group. Elisabetta Bugianese. This is, uh, how can I say, uh, a big advantage because at the same time uh, we had a large discussion uh, with uh, the endocrinologist, uh, the obesiologist, uh, and it was very helpful for us and for them as well because what we really want to convey is a shared way of managing patients with muscle D and uh, with all the other these metabolic driven disease. And in this sense, this these guidelines uh, included for the first time the new nomenclature, muscle T, metabolic dysfunction associated steatotic liver disease, that in some way, I can I say, highlighted the metabolic roots of this disease. And it is easier in this way to put in the context of the main non-communicable diseases such as type 2 diabetes, obesity, hypertension, and so on. Also because these patients share the same risk factors and also the same outcome. It's not by chance that people with muscle D die uh, mainly because of cardiovascular causes, but then the liver becomes uh, an important competitor for outcome when fibrosis builds up. Frank Taka. Yeah, and I think what you, what you have to keep in mind, if three societies are involved, each society usually has their own process of dealing with evidence, weighing the evidence. So everything that you read in the guideline actually underwent approval by the Delphi panel, gets refinement, but also underwent approval by all three societies. So in order to make sure that what we actually recommend is uh, based on evidence, but it's also practicable in, in daily life, I think that was really important lesson for us that the liver needs to be integrated in a more holistic view of the management of cardiometabolic disorders as, as Elisabetta has highlighted. That was a very important learning, but in the end, it made the guidelines, I think, really much stronger than just focusing on, on the small aspect uh, that, that the liver represents in the whole spectrum of the disease. Roger Green. That makes tremendous sense to me. Uh, in, in the States, I know they were able to get together on a clinical care pathway that reflected a few differences societies, but nothing as ambitious as this. And, and by the way, they did that before the name change. The name change makes even more sense what you did, because instead of having something called 
NAFLD or NISH, which is out there by itself, it puts a steatotic liver disease right at the heart of metabolic dysfunction. So your timing was exquisite and it made a ton of sense. Louise, do you have questions? Louise Campbell. Yeah, I did. I thought it was a fantastic document. So congratulations to you all and the teams that did this, because I was saying just before we went online, it's not often that you get a pre-approval for a guideline of a drug that's not approved in the area that the guideline's been introduced into. So that's dynamic and that's really dynamic hepatology. And I, I, I love that leap of faith. So um, again, congratulations of being that forethinking. But the one question that did stick out to me, although we've got the other societies involved, we often talk about how much are they actually looking for muscles as an underlying co-related condition? Because we're obviously assessing for it and looking for it. And we see the co-link with type 2 diabetes, and cardiovascular disease, hypertension, and hyperlipidemia. Do you think this is going to raise the profile within those specialities and they're going to look more now for it? Or are they just going to continue to sort of focus on the endocrine and cardiovascular parts of of the disease. It takes time. Ken Cousy was telling me that it was the same process for kidney complication in type 2 diabetes. In the beginning, no one among the diabetologists was seeing kidney complication, while the nephrologists, on the other hand, were seeing all these end-stage kidney disease from type 2 diabetes. So it is a matter of joining in the middle, because we cannot hide cirrhosis as a one of the possible outcome of type 2 diabetes as well as of the metabolic syndrome, but particularly type 2 diabetes and multiple components of the metabolic syndrome are very important risk factors for the progression to cirrhosis and also for the onset of hepatocellular carcinoma, primary liver cancer. So we shouldn't forget about that. And I was a bit afraid like when the name change was introduced that we would maybe lose the other societies. My experience during working on the guideline was that it's maybe even the opposite, uh, that we have now a clearer pathway, that we have a clear definition that puts the metabolic dysfunction into the center of the disease definition and that we can say, okay, if you find steatotic liver disease, you have the cardiometabolic risk profile, you exclude relevant consumption of alcohol, then you're there and you need to take this into account. And I think a lot of the recommendations, actually, we are the first guideline, I think, that has an, an own chapter on prevention, although like the chapter is not extensive, but uh, I think that will help from a political perspective to really enforce a healthy lifestyle to prevent even the muscle D tsunami, as, as you call it in your in your podcast. But then we have also case finding strategies that are applicable into the general practitioner setting in the setting of a diabetologist, of an endocrinology practice, of an obesity specialist. And hopefully like those simple pathways or simplified pathways will help to identify cases with advanced fibrosis or at risk steatohepatitis. As Elisabetta has pointed out, this is an important outcome. It needs to be recognized and needs to be kind of detected early enough in, in the course of uh, a metabolic disease or metabolic diseases. Frank, if you see Louise smiling and nodding, it's only because she believes what you just said about us firmly. She believes anything about this disease, right? I, I, I know that smile when I see it. Yeah. Yes. I think the prevention, and I think that was the other thing that really impressed me about the documentation, the definitions of where a cap comes in. We can now get people in their 20s and 30s with early steatotic liver disease that we can really look for prevention and we can actually take the figures and the metrics on preventing not only steatotic liver disease and reversing it, but also the cardiovascular and the diabetes reduction and things like that. So I just think it's way out there. It's one of the most impressive guidelines that I've seen in years, if any. So yeah, way out there. Uh, thank you, Louise, also for mentioning, oh, you you are bold in putting resmetrum on there. And we really, I think the late latest publication was actually from, from April and it uh, like went online in, in June or maybe even from May. So we really try to be up to date. We try to incorporate the last, we asked the Delphi panel, I think, about the revised resmetrum questions, Elisabeth. It was, I think, mid of May or so, right? It is, I think, the current state of the evidence that we have. And we, we can say um, resmetrum, for instance, not yet approved in Europe. However, the evidence was taken into account. That is also true for, for the other drugs that are being discussed there for glucose-lowering drugs, for treatment of um, cardiometabolic comorbidities. So we try to put all the evidence that was there into consideration. Of course, we needed to make compromises, like from a hepatology perspective, you wish you could have an MRI for everybody on, an, uh, let's say, biannual basis and so on to make sure that there is no HCC. But we kind of, I think, found a good compromise how to ensure case finding, practicability, and also realistic goals for, for 
for lifestyle management, for case finding strategies in, in the practice. So Frank, I, like Louise, was terribly impressed about adding resmeteram. I'm even more impressed when I find out that you were able to make adjustments within a month at the end of the process. And now, back to Roger. We hope you've enjoyed this recording. If you have any questions or comments about the content of this conversation or the entire episode, please put them in the review section of the page from which you downloaded this conversation or send an email to questions at surfingmash.com. Next week, Jeff Lazarus will join us to discuss the Healthy Liver, Healthy Lives initiative. Until then, stay safe, surf on. We'll see you on the podcast. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye now.